If you don't want to, you can remain standing. It's okay with me either way. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. I hope you're excited today because I'm excited. All around this world is darkness. All around this world. Every time we turn around, every time we turn the news on, it's so depressing. How many are tired of just watching the news? Just because every time you turn it on, you're like, man, there's something else. There's one more thing. Throughout Scripture, and I just kind of alluded to this, but throughout Scripture, the biblical pattern is that oftentimes God is ready to do his most powerful work in the middle of the darkest times. In the middle of the darkest times, God's about to show up. And that should excite us. It should get us fired up about that. Today, we live in dark times. We live in some of the darkest times the world's ever seen. And I believe that we're on the edge of a move of God that will sweep our nation and our world. I believe that. And I'm going to continue to believe that until you can change my mind. And you can't because I'm stubborn. Today, today, we need to get ready. We need to be prepared. We need to get ready for what's coming. As I said a couple weeks ago, I believe that a new revival that's coming will carry with it a wave of healing from spiritual to uh, physical to emotional. I believe we're going to see people set free from things like they never have before, like they've never seen before, like we've never seen before. I believe churches across the country are going to have to change the carpet at the altar because it's so, it's so stained with tears. I believe it. I can't wait. I can't wait to rip this carpet out because it's so saturated with the tears of people coming to get ready for what God has. I believe freedom will come to those who are in bondage and freedom will come to those who are trapped by pain. I believe that. John chapter 7. Jesus says these words, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Andrew Murray once said this, a true revival means nothing less than a revolution, casting out the spirit of worldliness and selfishness and making God and his love triumph in the heart and the life. Amen. Believe that. As I've said before, if you've heard me say it, maybe you have, maybe you hadn't. If you haven't, great, because I'm about to say it again. Before we can have rivers of life flowing from us, we have to get rid of the swamps full of bacteria and sewage that brings life to nothing. You're either a river or a swamp. That's all. You're either a river or a swamp. What does that mean? Rivers of life will flow through someone who is utterly devoted and in love with Jesus. Rivers of life will flow from you. If you don't have that relationship, you are spewing sewage to people around. You become a swamp. Am I with me so far? Revival is when the redemptive power of God turns a swamp into a river of living water that flows from within us. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever failed? God, there's a lot of you saints in this room. How many of you have ever failed? I can feel, I can feel the hands being lifted from online right now. Me. Every one of us in this room should lift our hands. If not, the altars are going to soak today. Have you ever run away when you failed? Do you ever run away? Do you ever experience that second chance to reset after you failed? You ever experienced that before? Do you know Jesus? Then you've experienced it. Jonah failed. He was redeemed with a second chance. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, was redeemed with a second chance. The regions of Israel were set on fire and flipped upside down by ordinary men who failed many times, who stepped into the presence of heaven and came out with a fire in their belly. But they failed first. Pentecost became a prototype for the revival cry and produced a blueprint for us as to what it looks like to saturate a culture with the culture of the kingdom. Think about Pentecost. 
Pentecost came, what happened? The power of God fell down, not so they could speak in tongues and do crazy things and, and, and just experience goosebumps. No, there was a purpose for it. The purpose for that outpouring of the Spirit of God was it so that they could go out and see thousands come to Jesus and the church be revived. That was the point. They created a culture. Their culture was saturated by the power of God. If we are called, which we are, to win the world for Jesus, we can't be afraid to come in conflict with it. We have to be ready to outlast the opposition. We have to come to a, to a place where, we're, where our skin is thick and our heart is tender because the enemy will come against us and attempt to cause division within the body of Christ. I've seen it too many times. He'll do whatever he can to tear the body of Christ apart. Before God delivers, he must deliver. You need to hear that again. Before God delivers, he must deliver. What does that mean? He must first deliver his people who can be found overwhelmed by intimidation and despondency. When God is about to lead his people into new territory and release a promise, the enemy will come in and attempt to take us back to the old habits of religion. There's an old song called, what is it, the old time religion? And get me away from old time religion. Get me away from new time religion. The apostle Paul said, and I paraphrase, religion is worthless without relationship. You don't need religion. Religion does nothing for us. There's a lot of religious people on, their, on the way to hell right now. Revival brings heat in the spiritual realm. This warfare that is coming will weed out the wannabes from the ones who will change history. Revival blows the face off of tradition. Some of you are getting mad at me right now. Don't. Don't get mad at me. Because we have to understand this stuff before we can see a move of God. We have to understand tradition will not bring revival. Religion will not bring revival. Sometimes a defining moment disguises itself as a crisis. Everybody hear that? Sometimes a defining moment disguises itself as a crisis. A crisis is seen through our eyes as a moment that is threatening to us. But from heaven's perspective, a crisis is an opportunity to discover something. A crisis will bring things to the surface that attempt to threaten our belief and our faith, but if we will take it for what it is, an opportunity for greatness in the midst of pain, we will see a breakthrough. The world stinks right now. It's terrible right now. But can we look at this crisis, this global crisis we have right now, and say, man, this means we're on the break of something. This means God's about to show up and do something. Crisis brings through breakthrough. Revival will be led by crisis or threatening moments, but those are the preparation periods for us to receive. You receive by preparing. Preparation comes through crisis. Ask anybody, ask anybody who's been saved, and I said this a few weeks ago, ask anybody who's been saved for any number of years, ask them if they've ever gone through crisis and what did God do for them in the middle of the crisis to bring them to where they are today. We can never think that if God shows up, the devil won't show up as well. We have to train ourselves to be spiritually minded and sensitive to what the enemy would like to do. Revival is one of the messiest things you will ever encounter. Besides grace. Grace is messy. Grace is messy. Think about where you were before you met Jesus. If you are in this room and you don't know Jesus, ask some of these people. Let me tell you. I was in a pit. I was in a terrible place before I met Jesus. But when he came in, in the middle of all my mess, and picked me up and showed me what true grace looked like, let me tell you, it was messy. Revival is out of our comfort zones. Religion, tradition, and ritualistic behavior will be replaced by relationship, repentance, and the heart of God felt by humanity. That's revival. Revival. In 1734, during the Great Awakening, led by Pastor Jonathan Edwards, P. 
people who were at this revival, they were observers. This is what they said about it. It pleased God to display his free and sovereign mercy in the conversion of a great multitude of souls in a short space of time, turning them from a formal, cold, and careless profession of Christianity to the lively exercise of every Christian grace and the powerful practice of our holy religion. Revival will bring about transformation. God supernaturally transforms believers and non-believers in a church, a region, a nation, and a world through sudden, intense enthusiasm for Jesus. That's revival. The Great Awakening, which was the first revival of historic significance. A young man named Jonathan Edwards from Northampton, Massachusetts, was the pastor. After a few months of fruitless labor, he reported five or six Five or six conversions. He was frustrated. And one of those converts was a young lady who had been, in their words, one of the greatest company keepers of the whole town. Figure out what that means. Edwards was fearful that her conversion would douse the flame. But the opposite took place. You see, God makes beauty from ashes. That's revival. God makes beauty from ashes. 300 souls were converted in six months in a town of 1,100 people. The news spread quickly, and revival broke out over 100 towns in the surrounding areas. Fire spreads quickly, and it only takes one flame. It took one flame. 11 true revivals have started over the centuries that sparked from a small-town preacher in Massachusetts. Isaiah 64.1 was a cry of revival from the heart of the prophet Isaiah. This is what it says. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. I think about that day. I think about when he, what it must have looked like when he said that. When he's crying, he's probably ripping his, ripping his robe off. He's probably on his knees, weeping, tears falling down his face. And he screams the top of his lungs, Oh, that you would rend the heavens. Oh, that you would open up the heavens and come down. That the mountains might quake at your presence. Oh, that you would let your presence fall on humanity once again. The church has to get to the place where our prayer is not simply selfishness, but it's a place where our prayer is, God, open up the heavens so that all mankind may experience your presence in these last days. Today, there are a few things that we should know about revival. You have to know things. We have to teach. We have to talk about it. There's a few things you need to know. Number one, revival cannot be scheduled. Can't be scheduled. It's not a predictable thing that God does. There are no natural laws that guarantee revival. True revival is a sovereign work of the hand of God. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 says this, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might nor by power, but my, by my spirit, says the Lord. By my spirit, not by you, by my spirit. In other words, revival is a miracle right before our eyes. If we allow religion to rule his presence, we will not see a move of God, and we will create a counterfeit. I should be getting a lot more amens than this. this, We don't want counterfeit here. We don't want counterfeit revival. I don't want people jumping around just because they're jumping around. I want people to be changed by the power of God. Changed. Think about last Sunday night. If you were here last Sunday night, you know what I'm talking about. Our prayer and worship service last Sunday night. I think about how we came into that room because the staff was talking about, we were talking about this together this past week. What's the difference between 
prayer and worship night on a Sunday night and Sunday morning? What's the difference? Why, why on a Sunday night does it feel like we're just so much more open to what God has than we do on a Sunday morning? Why, why, why does it feel more uptight on a Sunday morning? Like, uh, I'll tell you why. Because when you come to a prayer and worship night, we come with this expectation that God's about to show up. We're coming believing. We're coming believing in the one who lives inside of us, that he's about to wreck us somehow. We come believing. What if we could transform Sunday night into Sunday morning? What if Sunday morning we came in here every week expecting that God's going to shake us? He's going to do something different in our life. He's going to mess us up somehow. Are you okay with being messed up? Are you okay with being wrecked? You're already messed up anyway. Why not let God mess us up a little bit? So Sunday mornings, come in here, ready. I'll invite you there. Hey, I'll invite you because you're the first ones hearing this message. Congratulations. There's a second service coming. I'll invite you to wipe your schedule clean. I'll dare you. Wipe your schedule clean. Come to second service with them and show them how to worship. We have to develop inside of us an expectation of more of what God has. Revival can't be scheduled. Number two, revival is the influence of driving grace. What does this mean? J.I. Packer defines revival as this, a work of God by his spirit through his word, bringing the spiritually dead to living faith in Christ and renewing the inner life of Christians who have grown slack and sleepy. Or, in other words, revival is going, is God stirring the hearts of his people. He's visiting them, coming to dwell with them, returning to them, pouring out his spirit on them to quicken their consciences and show them their sins and exalt his mercy right before their eyes. We're scared to death of God showing us our sin. But let me tell you something, when he shows you his sin, your sin, he doesn't do it to embarrass you. He shows you his sin so that, so your sin so that he can change you. That's why. That's why it's so important to let God bring to the surface the things that we need to change because God's never going to leave us there. Look, here's how filthy you are. Congratulations. God doesn't do that. God says, this is how filthy you are, but this is what grace looks like. No one deserves revival. We don't deserve it no more than we deserve salvation. We can never expect what we don't deserve. If God were were not to send one, no one could protest that an injustice had been done. So revival is not demanding that God pour it out as if he were in our debt. God's not obligated but it's the compassion and loving kindness of God that brings revival. It's the loving compassion of God that sees his people. It starts with me. Sees his people going after him and asking, please, God. Looking at the scripture and standing on the fact that if I draw near to him, he'll draw near to me. And making that my heart's cry. If I draw near to you, You said you would draw near to me, so I'm going to spend this time, Sunday night, Sunday morning, whatever it may be, Monday through Saturday, I'm going to spend this time drawing near to you so that you might just grace me with your presence one time and change my life. Number three, we play a part in revival. I got to go quick. I got to hurry up. We play a part in revival. Passivity is never justified. Salvation, healing, revival, and any other outpouring of God's affection towards us are done by his grace. What is our job in this? If it's only by his grace, if he can only do it, what is our part in it? To pray, to seek him, to work for it. Jonathan Edwards once said, when God is about to bestow some great blessing on his church, It is often his manner in the first place, so to order things in his providence as to show his church their great need of it and to bring into distress a want of it. And so put them up 
upon crying earnestly to him for it. What does this mean? What does this mean? Listen, we look around the world right now. We see all the garbage going around, the things going on around the world right now. What does that mean? God is showing us the need for revival. He's showing it to us. He created a TV so we could all see it. We're, wa- we're, we're watching it unfold right before our eyes. The church should not be the ones that are scared right now. The sh- church should not be the ones that are afraid. But so many times the church gets more scared than the world. Why? Because we've read Revelation. Congratulations, if we've read Revelation, we know in the end we win, so it doesn't matter. Number four, prayer for revival can be costly. It may cost you your comfort. It may cost you convenience. Our tendency is to pray for revival because we think it's the religious thing to do, only to find out that when it comes, we find ourselves thinking that this wasn't what I signed up for. We say we want revival, but on our terms. We say, come Holy Spirit, but only if you promise in advance to do things the way that we have always done them in our church. Come Holy Spirit, but only if you have some sort of prior guarantee that when you show up, you won't embarrass me. How about this? Come Holy Spirit, but only if your work of revival is one that I can still control, one that preserves the traditions with which I am so comfortable. So here's the question we have to ask ourselves. How much change am I willing to accept in order to reach the point where the Holy Spirit is no longer quenched? Does God look at our church and say, I can move freely anytime I want to right there because they're not letting anything get in the way? Or is there hesitation? Number five, humility is essential to the onset of revival. Openness to whatever God says, to follow him where he leads, regardless of the social, personal, physical, or financial cost. Pride often manifests itself in self-sufficiency, which is a demand for control over what God is doing. A reluctance to trust God with our emotions and an excessive concern for our reputation and our image. There's so many churches like that. We're so afraid. If we get emotional, if we get emotional before God, somebody's going to think something. We have to get rid of that stuff. We just have to let God be God. Number six. I promise this is the last one. We are called to seek God's face. We are called to seek God's face. Insatiable hunger and unquenchable thirst for God will come when we seek him. The point is, the more you seek him, the more your desire for revival will come. I have an 18-year-old daughter that's been in Alabama for a week and a half. She's at home. I talk to her every day. Y'all know know mercy. Talk to her every day. Talk to her every day. I see her every day. She's been gone for a week and a half, and I miss her. And I start thinking, she's never home anyway. I just see her passing by. The point is, I see her. I haven't seen her. I haven't talked to her much. I find myself missing her. But I only miss her because I spent time with her. I only miss her because I know her. Understand? Understand? You can't miss something you don't know. So if I haven't put myself vulnerable before God and spent time with him, I'm not going to miss him when he's not here. I'm not going to miss him when he doesn't show up. I believe that God is always ready to bring it. But the question is, are we ready to receive it? This week... A challenge for you. Prepare your hearts for God's word, his presence, his blessing. He's ready. The question is, are you? Next week, I'm going to talk about the rivals of revival.
talk about those things that will come against the whole idea, the whole movement of God. Those things that the enemy throws at us, or even sometimes we throw at ourselves, to stop a move of God. So don't miss next week. But today, I just want to challenge you. Understand that God wants to, wants to move. He wants to. He desires it. The question is, do we desire it? I challenge you when you come in here every week. Come with an expectation. Come with an expectation. Come with the same expectation you have when you come on a prayer worship night on a Sunday night. By the way, our next one is going to be, I think, October 17th. We're going monthly on these things. We're just, it's, it's too good. They're too good. So right now we're going monthly. I love you guys. And I really want to see, I really want to see God move in our church. Let me pray for you, Jesus. Oh, we believe in you. We believe that you're so much bigger than we are. But God, in the majestic and powerful being that you are, we also recognize that you're personal, that you want to be close to us. So God, help us. Help us to just seek you. Help us to not stop. Help us to remember those moments, those God moments we had in our lives where you changed us, where you did something special in our life. Even if we're going through hard times right now, even if we're, we're struggling in areas of our lives, help us to remember you're still faithful. You're still God, and you still are so in love with us. Help us every day to fall more in love with you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.